Good evening, everyone, or good day, everyone. This is Ed Woods here, marketing mentor who loves small business, and I'm sitting here with the amazing entrepreneur, Kat Tate. How are you, Kat? Very well, thank you. And and Kat Tate is an amazing channel partner of mine. She is a brilliant online copywriter and strategic storyteller, aren't you, Kat Tate? I suppose I am. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just named what she did for a living, and it's interesting. We're sitting in my kitchen, and we've got, what have we got here? We've got... Uh, Cheese. Crackers. Uh, I think that's cucumber, isn't it? A cucumber. Yeah, it's lovely. It, exactly. We've got an amazing spread. And Kat and I are actually having some, basically some wine and cheese before we do our webinar tonight. And um, I've been meaning to do this anyway. I actually interview Kat and get to hear her story. And we actually started exchanging our stories. And we thought, why don't we record this and make this an awesome entrepreneur interview? What did you think of that, Kat? I thought, fantastic. Absolutely. Let's do it. Now, where it was, Kat Tate's um, an amazing copywriter. I'm actually a brilliant copywriter. But Kat Tate's better than me. And and I've been very lucky to work with Kat Tate, and I refer a lot of work for her to take people's ideas into powerful words that sell in. I think you're really good at that, Kat, and I just want to think, do you think you're really good, Kat? I do. Great. Writing writing is an art form. Yes. Um, Just like design and, you know, anything, any other creative um, avenue that you choose to take, writing is an art form. It's something that takes a long time to finesse and to perfect, and it never is perfect. Um, but I love it. I love what I do. So I was going to say, Kat, I mean, tell me, tell us your story. I mean, I mean, you're an amazing copywriter. I've seen your work firsthand. I'll refer you gladly to my clients. You do. Thank you very much. And the check's in the mail. And uh, <laughs> no, no, Kat's been an amazing client one too. And, um, but t- tell us your story. Like, what did you do when you are at uni? How did you become the successful entrepreneur you are today? Um, look, I've been writing since I was able to walk, really. My parents had a typewriter and the first thing I did when I learned to walk and stand at a typewriter was write short stories. Um, so I started really, really young. My dad was a journalist and still is, um, quite a prominent journal. He went to Fleet Street uh, when he was 18 and uh, interviewed Roy Orbison and Rod Stewart and all sorts of people back back in the day. So I, I loved what he did and, um, and wanted to follow in his footsteps, which was the plan. So what I did was while I was at uni, I actually um, started working at the Sunday Times in Perth. And that was, it's the sister paper of the Daily Telegraph, basically, for those Sydney, Sydney siders. Oh, so listening. it's a good right-leaning. Oh, yeah. It's, so it's a pro-liberal newspaper. Oh, yeah. And they're small guys. Are they just, are they just, do they just love Tony Abbott the way I do? Look, I don't know what their policy is. I don't read the paper anymore being in Sydney, but I'm, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. But no, it was a great paper to work for. And the plan there was um, that I would work my way up and get a cadetship like my dad did at the same newspaper when he was the same age. No way. So you were like a, a young Chris Hansen. You're just working your way up the uh, tree. That was the plan. That was the plan. So, um, yeah, and I was doing a graveyard shift one night, which was basically sitting next to the police radio at 3 in the morning waiting for a story to come through. And uh, I so had- Stop right there. So you're saying as a journalist... You would sit there listening to the police radio. As a 17-year-old, yes. So you're listening. Is that legal? Absolutely. So a journalist is allowed to listen to a police commute channel? Yes, because it's put out there for the media to listen to. Um, The police and the media actually have a really good relationship, particularly in Perth. Uh, They share stories a lot. Um, Press releases are sent through from the, the police department and we can rewrite them for the paper. So... They've got a pretty strong relationship. The, the police have a, a reason to get that information out to the public. Wow. So you guys get along. So you're so you're a 17-year-old version of – so it was about two years ago, right? So uh, no, 18 months ago. <laughs> yeah. Zero, zero. Uh, just so you know, everyone, um, yeah, Kat's an amazing woman. So there you go. Oh, so okay. th- there you go. So you're a 17-year-old cat. You're sitting there and you're listening to a police radio waiting for action. That's it. What would, what would happen when you're sitting in Perth uh, waiting for action? What kind of stuff would you hear? Crickets. No, I'm kidding. There was, there was actually, things actually did happen in, in Sleepy Old Perth. Um, look, unfortunately, a lot of it was things like car accidents. Uh. And actually, that's the reason why I changed my direction from hard news because I had a comment made to me one night <clears throat> by someone on the editorial team who basically told me to pray for a double fatality to get a good front page lead. And that just changed everything because I realised, okay, I'm, I've got into writing because I want to change the world through words. I feel like that's my calling and to be working in a way that actually is wishing for, for ill to come on people for my own benefit is not what I want to do. So 
that was a big shift for me. Wow, wow. And uh, excuse the noise in the background. <laughs> We've got two cats. Our office staff are fighting each other. Yeah. Um, you need to do some mediation there. Yeah, we need mediation. Yeah. Uh, not meditation. No. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That must have been scary. So yeah. you're sitting there as a 17-year-old, you're listening to a police comm channel, and you're told to hope for a double fatality. Yes. What was your immediate reaction? What went through your mind when this information hit your senses? Well, you know how when people say that something, it's like a, like, like a light bulb moment or it's like a brick wall goes up or, you know, there's a really profound moment in their life? That's what that was. So it was the next day that I decided I couldn't do couldn't do hard journalism anymore. It wasn't my thing. So what happened the next day? So you got up, you arrived at work. What did you do? Um, look, I, I figured I'd sort of keep going for a little bit until I worked out my next move. Um, but as things in my life seem to have happened um, in a way that things just fall into place, there was a phone call that came through the newsroom and I happened to pick the phone up. And it was an old family friend uh, of my family's who now had her own PR company. And uh-huh. she called, yes, and she called to uh, blast one of the journalists for a story about her client. And I recognised the name and the voice and started talking to her and mentioned that, you know, I'd been thinking about making a shift out of journalism. And she said, well, I'm looking for someone to come into my PR firm and work as a junior and work their way up. What do you think? Wow. So you just became a publicist from day one. I did, straight into it. So complaints are a good thing. Yeah. So you, 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 were, you were about to take a complaint and you ended up getting an awesome job and a new break. Yeah, which took me on a whole new path and, and took me to where I am now. So, so what is it? tell us what the odds, what does a publicist actually do? What did you actually do at this PR firm? Uh, look, there's, there's, a whole, um, there's a whole, you know, big picture view when it comes to public relations. So what we would do is we would start with a client, um, find out a bit about what they want to promote or publicise in their business and come up with a communication strategy. And often that would be a 12 month plan. So we're looking at things like, okay, what's coming up that you want to promote? Uh, what events are on out there that we can actually leverage off? So let's just say, um, you know, you've got a client in the gift basket area. Yeah, you'd go out and it. find events on, you know, Valentine's Day and all the obvious ones and maybe some more obscure events that you can promote. Um, we would launch and stage media events as well and invite the media along, um, writing press releases, a lot of sort of client liaison work. Um, one client of ours actually was a, a national park and we, we had to come up with a crisis communications plan and actually when there was a bushfire, we were the first port of call for when the media were making inquiries and so that was a really intense uh, part of the job which was quite rewarding as well. So during what, bushfires in Perth? You were the first line, you were the first call once. Yeah, the- once the news hits, there's a fire and it's at the park that, that we represent. The, the journos call us because they know we've got that relationship with them. They know that that's who they need to call. And it's our job to then, uh, um, I suppose, line up those media calls, get them through to the client, get the information back to the media so they can give it to the public. Wow, so you've yeah. worked in some pretty high stress, extreme situations. Yes, and this was all before I was 20. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought you were like 25 about this point in the story. So before no, you were 20. Because what happened was I actually, um, I finished school quite young. I finished year 12 when I was 16 and went straight to university. So my first year at uni, I was 17. And I went straight through uni, finished a three-year degree and was out pretty pretty young. It's funny, so that I was actually 17 when I was at uni. Were you? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, and when I was 18, I went and joined the army. There oh, you go. Oh, look at you. Yeah, look Doing at me now. Country. Yeah, now a traumatised <laughs> marketing mentor. Yeah. That, um, that's amazing. So before the age of 20, you've already worked in a newsroom, you've been up all night listening to police comm channels, you've had epiphanies, mm-hmm. and you've already done crisis management. Yeah. In extreme situations before the age of 20. Yes. <laughs> Not bad. No, no, no wonder you're this brilliant, amazing person in front of you with those experiences. Oh, well, yeah. It's funny. You don't really think about the things that you do until someone says, hey, you did this and you did this and you did this. And it's like, oh, I've actually done quite a lot. I think it's very um, compelling. So what happened after that? So, like, was it obviously we're in Sydney now. Yes. How did you get to Sydney? Like, where did you say I'm sick of this mining colony called Perth? <laughs> You can never get sick of Perth. It's a beautiful place. Hey, what happened? Um, How did you wind up in, in my well, uh, kitchen? Well, look, the, the Perth, as beautiful as Perth is, the media market at the time, and I guess you know still is, uh, was very small. And there's only so far you can go. So it got to the point where I thought, okay, I've, I've, um, I've 
had some great inroads here. I've done some great work with some fantastic clients, but Perth doesn't really have much going on for me anymore. Uh, I guess another big part was that I was born in Sydney and always planned to return. Oh, ah, born yeah. in Sydney, huh? Yeah. Where were you born? Born up in Newport on the beaches. So. And, and so now you live in Manly Beaches. Exactly. You, you, re- you return back to the place of your birth, That's did you? That's it. Back to my roots and it feels great. So the shift from Perth to Sydney happened when um, really I just started applying for public relations work in Sydney and uh, caught the eye of ANZ Stadium, Telstra Stadium at the time, Olympic Stadium. Goes, goes by a few names, <laughs> depending on the sponsorship at the time. Um, and they actually flew me over from Perth to Sydney to hang out with them for the weekend and go to a few sports games and interview myself and, you know, get a feel for the organisation. And they offered me the job when I flew back to Perth. So then I came over. <laughs> you're, you're like a superstar, so you're in Perth. Yeah. You apply for jobs remotely. You get flown out to Telstra Stadium for the weekend. Yes. And you became a, what, a publicist for Public relations for tele- coordinator. For Olympic Park. For the entire stadium, yes. My um, God. You're yeah. a, you've had some pretty high-profile art positions, I Kat have. I have. I've, um, yeah, I feel I've been very fortunate. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm sure luck is part of it, Kat, but surely your skills and prowess of words would attest to you getting those roles. Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I won't argue with that. Trying to make out your egotistical because yeah. I think your success is amazing. Why? And I'm not asking. I'm not trying to set you up to be egotistical. Mm. But why did you get those prestigious roles? What traits about yourself did they think were very employable? That's a very hard question to answer. Um, look, I guess growing up in a family with a journalist as a dad um, and mixing with a lot of prominent people from a young age. I grew up quite quickly. So, you know, I'd be at media launches when I was eight talking to celebrities and whoever, you know. So I just sort of, um, I was always used to adult company. I, I discovered a way to present myself that, um, that um, you know, formed really good relationships with people because that's what my dad did. He was a gossip journalist at the end of his career, towards the end of his career. He's retired now. But even when he was a gossip journalist, he always... Uh, he kept his word. He never broke promises with those people that he was writing about. Um, and he formed really good relationships with people. So I think I, I just naturally, you know, absorbed that. And so it's always been my mm. thing to to put people before anything else. Um, and maybe that's helped. Yes, I can imagine. They, I can imagine you would have just gone in there and they would have just felt your energy and realised, no, this woman understands what we're about. We yeah. definitely want to offer her the role. Yeah. And, look, I think that uh, even though I would have had gaps in my skill set at that age, um, having only had one PR job outside of university, um, I think they saw definitely the potential there. Um, they saw the strength in my writing as well and they, they gave me a shot. So it was brilliant. So you got... <laughs> Offer your job, you packed your bag, you yeah. flew over to Sydney, yeah. and, and then what you see started this job. You got this amazing job. What then happened? So I was there for just over a year, and it was a fantastic job. You know, I met David Beckham. Um, I'd be in the change room. <laughs> I'd be in the change rooms and there's NRL players just undressing in front of me with no care in the world and I'm sort of trying to be professional and not look and, you know, and just seeing all these great people and... and um, so you had the iPhone up? No, you no, didn't. no. This is a pre-iPhone age, so... Oh. <laughs> I think I had a Blackberry at the time. Ah, so you had your old Blackberry yeah. making you sending emails. Yeah, but that's This it. might have been before YouTube as well. <laughs> These days we'd upload straight to YouTube, wouldn't we? Yeah, but not then. Um, but I loved it. I loved the mm. thrill of – and I'm not really a big sports person, to be honest. I don't really enjoy watching sport except AFL, which is fabulous. Um, well, you know I'm a Victorian, don't you? I do. You're a yeah. Victorian. As a proud Victorian, we're very proud of AFL. I know that. I think all sports suck, but I'm very proud of yes, AFL. I sport. feel the same way. Yeah. <laughs> sports sucks, but if I have to watch it, AFL. That, that's right, because Perth's an AFL town. It is. We don't have NRL. You're a real town. Yeah. Only New South Wales is corrupted with this rugby this stuff. This so-called rugby. Uh, I, and, and it's not like this interview is being recorded and it's not going to go up on my blog and get viewed hundreds of times, mm-hmm. but I think rugby's, I think it's a bit... Yeah, a bit bit bogany, don't you, uh, Kato? <laughs> no comment, Ed Zia. Yeah, actually, we could have rugby clients. We like rugby. We like rugby. <laughs> All codes of rugby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you've got to give it to rugby. They do know how to beat each other up out on the field. They do. 
Well done. Much more violent than AFL. Yeah. So you're here. You're you've got this amazing job, this amazing life. What what was before you started off as the amazing entrepreneur you are today? What what job were you in before that, and what were the events that made you say it's time for me to be my own woman? Well. There's another chapter oh, to be revealed. There's a hidden chapter. There's a hidden chapter. Oh, I, I want to hear Would it. Would you like to hear the hidden chapter? The first you hear it on the Edward Files. <laughs> exclusive. Mm. The exclusive chapter is that um, I, after the stadium, I took a job working for the Heart Foundation. Oh, wow, not for profit. Not for profit. Um, working in their PR department. And um, that was great because I I felt like I was starting to make a difference with my work, which is what I was always planning to do, is find some way to to use words to benefit the world in some way. So that was brilliant. Um, But look, it it wasn't quite right for me. And I, being the entrepreneur that I am, I decided to quit in the middle of the recession and become a professional organiser. Right. Very abstract, I know. And obviously, the obviously this. Um, so was this the dark chapter? No, it wasn't. It oh, wasn't. okay. It actually set me up for the business I'm in now. So um, look, started it in the recession, and considering it was in in a poor time when people weren't spending money on having people organise their homes for them because it's a luxury service, I still did quite well. So I was quite happy with with what I did. But wow, the funny thing is hmm. that um, looking back, I can see the reason I did well was because. I marketed my business brilliantly. I knew how to talk to the media, so I got a lot of press coverage without having to pay a cent by writing my own press releases and chasing media and developing uh, relationships with those contacts and blogging and, you know, writing feature articles um, about organising that got placed in magazines. So looking back, I maybe wasn't in the right industry in terms of doing the actual organising job, but I knew how to start a business and promote it really well and create a tribe. So their skills that although that business failed mm. in a business sense, um, it was a practice run for where I'm at now. Yeah, because I think it's amazing because the I mean I mean I've known you for what maybe one and a half years now. Mm-hmm. I mean the side of cat tape I've seen is a woman that never misses, <laughs> you know. And um, and the thing is, I remember you once telling me you're a professional organizer. Yeah. And it's always wow. You know, I once tried currency trading, oh. and that was a train wreck. Right? Oh. I'm, I'm now a successful marketing mentor. Yes. And my, my Wolf on Wall Street days, uh, you know, um, got me shot by a hunter. You know, <laughs> it, it just didn't wash. Yeah. And isn't it funny? Isn't it funny that how a lot of people in life fail, mm. but we've had our failings, but we just took it as a next stepping stone to success. Yeah. How can someone like you think so differently to the masses? Because I know most people would have taken that to heart and given up. How did you overcome failure and all that? What was going through your mind? Look, again, I think it goes back to um, my childhood and my dad was very entrepreneurial and my mum never said money was important. The important thing was that you find something that you love and, you you know, you do what you want to do um, and you'll have a good life. And I guess I sort of took those lessons through. Um, so I've just always had a drive. I've, I've never, and the other thing too is um, we had a very independent family. You know, we were brought up to be quite independent, not have to depend on anyone. So I think moving to Sydney on my own, and by the way, I didn't actually know a soul here when I moved to Sydney. Wow. I didn't know anyone. Um, wow. You know, it's just having resilience. And it, I think that is something you can learn, but I also think it's part of your nature. So. If you can look at every experience you have as being a lesson, not a good or a bad thing that's happened to you, but a lesson, then you'll always be optimistic. Always. Mm. So your, I suppose, the prism in which you look at the world at Mm -hmm. has given you this amazing sense of resilience and optimism, which has contributed to you being a powerful entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. And look, I don't want to say it's all rosy. I mean, when I had my organising business, um, I lost all my money. And you'd be able to to relate to that. Oh Mr. yes, <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. As a burnt out Persian, there you go. Yeah. So I lost all my money and um, didn't have anyone to back me up. I, you know, wasn't married, didn't have a partner, anything like that. My family, I've never asked them for money, um, and that was a really tough time. But I got the right help. I went and saw some financial planners who helped me get back on track. I went back to full time employment 
and um, which was great because I ended up adding a whole other suite of writing skills to my my set. Um, and you know, I just worked hard. What after you did that and you went back to full time employment? What were you doing? So I joined a company, um, and funnily enough. They're actually my clients still today. I still write for them as a freelancer. <laughs> no way. Yes, because they're so fantastic. Um, the company is the HI Pages Group, and they're an online directory business. So they have the natural therapy pages, the home improvement pages, and pet pages. So if you're looking for, for example, a plumber in your area, you type in plumber in your suburb, and uh, all the listings come up for you. My job basically was, um, and credit to the people who hired me, was actually crafted around the skills that I had. I walked in, there was no job there, but they created it for me. And um, basically I, I set an editorial strategy into place for them. So to drive a lot of traffic to the website, I came up with a plan for hiring freelance writers and building a really big database of online articles. So these are articles we could share on our Facebook pages and through Twitter. Um, we could interview clients about trends in you know whatever industry they were in and build this great database of knowledge that we could share with our audience. Wow, wow. So, and, and they're a client of yours today. They're still my client. Yep. So, this is amazing. So, take us forward. And I know before we sat down to do this interview yep. and, um, you know, I was getting the uh, the wine, cheese and uh, crackers ready. You said you're off to Vietnam in two weeks. I so, am. What's all this about? So, what I did was uh, oh, in June of 2012, I realised that, I got to a point with my work at HI Pages where I felt like I'd done all I could do and I was no longer adding value to the company. And for me, having that entrepreneurial spirit, I can't just go in and take a paycheck if I don't feel like I'm challenging myself or I'm benefiting the business. That's very noble of you. It's, it, it, you know, in a way it's almost selfish because I wasn't enjoying it and I didn't feel like it was right to stay there. But I, I, I sort of see what you're saying. But... What I, so what I did is I decided to go to India for a month, India and Nepal. Uh, when was this? Uh, this was June 2012. Ah, got it. So I took a little holiday and had no plan. I simply went with two friends to India, landed in Delhi, and we worked our way up to Nepal. And um, really it was a life-changing experience where I got a lot of clarity on my next move, which is why I'm going to Vietnam, because I'm looking for another eye-opening experience. And you're saying that while you're in Vietnam, you're going to rethink your whole, whole life and come back some kind of machine or something, are you? Hopefully not a machine. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to stay a person. <laughs> no, no, I know what you're saying. This will be RoboCat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah RoboCat. Yeah, RoboCat. Yeah, bringing robotic copy to a, a business near you. Um, yeah, no, the plan is um, to rebrand my business in the year ahead. So I'm really just taking a bit of a break get some clarity on what that next move is and, and see what unfolds. It's funny you say that because um, it was really interesting to me because when I, um, as you know, I used to yeah, have a pretty high-flying job and I got yeah. re really badly washed up in the GFC. And I remember um, I was in Sydney and I was unemployed from professional work for about one and a half years. Okay. Really bad. That's wow. where I lost all my money. Really, yeah, wasn't wasn't good for me. And I remember um, even though it was very painful at the time, in looking back on that as an old Persian man of 35 with two cats, <laughs> I'm just really old and over the hill now. Um, when I look back on that, I kind of feel that, you know, in a way that was my chance to reset my life and start it again. And isn't it funny that you sort of go through life, you sort of reach a point where you think, need to, something needs to be tweaked. Yeah. Something needs to be changed. Yeah. What do you think you need, of that uh, you topic? A, you need a shift. Look, what's really interesting at the moment and, and it's something I've been noticing in the world as a whole, it's not just, you know, in my work, but the world itself, is there's a real shift at the moment towards authenticity. There is, isn't there? And no absolutely. more crap anymore. No more crap. And no one wants to be spoon-fed information. Um, we can see through things like false claims, really sloppy advertising, um, and even think people don't want to be, you know, told what shows to watch and when to watch them. They're going to go online and watch them when they want. That's just one example. Another example is food. People now want to know what's in their food. Where's it come from? Where's it grown? How is it grown? Did you use any pesticides? Who's the farmer? How did it get to this shop? There's a real shift in the world at the moment, and there are a lot of people driving that shift who I call the change makers. And I feel like I'm a part of that wave. So I think the next year, 
and beyond, it's going to be really interesting to see um, the results of that shift. It's funny you say that because, as you know, I started my – well, you, if you're listening to this interview, you probably found it in uh, my blog. And one thing I found interesting is um, I started my blog called The Edward Files and um, as part of my own blog is – I've been doing that. Like I've been mm. speaking a lot of truths in my own blog, mm-hmm. you know, and I've been very critical of some people, which I don't think people have been critical of enough. Mm-hmm. And it's funny when you do that. It's funny when you go out on a limb. You do start a bit of a following. You do start a bit of a revolution in your own way, don't you, Kat? You do. And it's the whole tribe building. So, Well, what is this tribe building thing? Take us through so it, Kat. There's a concept that, through your life and through your business, you align yourself with certain tribes. So you can call it your audience, your target market, but in an authentic sense, it's your tribe. So what you're doing, Ed, when you're blogging about these things that are important to you and when you have an opinion, you start to attract people who really understand and find your message that resonates with them. That becomes your tribe. These are your number one fans. Uh-huh. The awesome thing is that when you start building a tribe, these are the people that then go and share your message with even more people to come into your tribe. So you're not having to do much work because people are sticking to your ideas and going, yes, that's what I need in my life. And, hey, Sally over there might find that useful too. And they recruit people into your tribe. It's interesting you say that because, as you know, we're running our first free one-day seminar. Yes. Everyone's sharing it for us. So are these people who are part of my tribe who like my information and they're sharing it? Is that what you mean? That's exactly right. The other thing too to think about with tribes, and this is something that people, um, and you might be finding this because because you're quite, you know, strong in your opinions, which is fantastic. I'm not strong in my opinions. How dare you accuse me? (laughs) Everyone (laughs) knows Mr. Red has opinions, and that's fantastic. But what you need to remember, if you are going to go out there and, and start building a tribe and start having a voice, whether you share that voice through a blog or social media or however you want to do it, you will start to polarize people. You are Mm. absolutely going to lose fans. You will heave some people off. Which I have done in record numbers lately. But fantastic. Because if you're polarising people, it means that you're actually making a difference in some way. Your message isn't going to resonate with everyone. Not everyone's going to like what you have to say. That doesn't matter. So long as you're putting out things that you think are important, your ideas and insights that are helping a certain amount of people, um, your tribe, they're keeping your tribe happy, don't worry about the rest. Yeah. It's funny you say that, and I'll um, and I'll be straight up with you. I'm all right now, like yeah. I'm over it now. But as you know, the start of the year was emotionally very tough for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a lot of people. I even had nasty phone calls of people um, trying to shut down my blog. Really? Yeah, I had nasty phone calls of people trying to shut down my blog because, I mean, what I would do um, in my blog and when I'm writing, I'm, it's, I'm getting you know at least forty reads a day now. It's mm-hmm. getting really. It's starting to get there now. Is that you know, I would, um, you know, if I praise someone, such as I praise you, I'll do it publicly. Mm-hmm. If I'm negative about someone or a situation, I'll just write generally. I'm not an Andrew Bolt. I'm not going to sit there and name that person. I'm not like that. Not just for legal reasons, but I just don't do that sort of thing. You know, I'll praise in public and, you know, I'm not going to publicly attack anyone. But what was interesting is I'll just write general articles about, mm-hmm. I would never write about anyone. I'll just write about general behaviour. And... The bad people know when they read it, they've got the guilty conscience. They were the right. first ones that would try and shut me down. <laughs> so I had probably at least five abusive phone calls. And they're just general blogs, mm. but people feel that it's written about them. It actually wasn't. It's was just a general blog about a certain behavior, but they took it on as them. Mm. And they were trying to shut me down. And it's so true. And I think I'm used to it now, but for me, it was quite a hard start to the year getting used to that. Mm, that's interesting. And so, good on you for, for sticking at it because I think a lot of people, that you know, that might be enough to turn them away. Um, oh, I started getting more vicious in my blogs. <laughs> Careful now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, I mean, look, you know, as you said, you don't, you don't intentionally – um, upset people or offend people and there's no point doing that because what purpose does that serve? Oh, and, and probably get you sued as well. Well, that's it. You've got to be really careful. But look, it's interesting that those people, even though you haven't written about them directly, they've taken personal offence to to those posts and I think that goes back to this whole quest for truth that's coming out at the moment, being your authentic self, being truthful. It can be really hard to see your flaws or weaknesses exposed, particularly if these are people in business. You know, we're quite... You know, our businesses are our babies. 
So if I read something that you write and, and it really hits a nerve with me, well, I would be looking at myself and go, well, why is that? What is it about that post that Ed wrote that's making me feel this way and what can I do to change it? Maybe my business approach isn't right. Maybe I'm not being truthful. Maybe I'm not giving my customers uh, the best product or service and, and not really meeting their needs. Yeah, and, and, but I think that's what would set you and us apart from, and a lot of people listening to this interview. Like if you're listening to this interview and you're this deep into it, you must be an amazing person. <laughs> well done on being amazing. Exactly. So well done for um, listening this long into the interview. But if you're still on the, you know, listening in or reading this, I mean, you're obviously the sort of character that's open to looking at yourself, mm -hmm. open to thinking about things a bit differently. And I think there's a lot of people out there who just don't want to do that. Yeah. They just want to blame the world for all their problems. They're not willing to take personal responsibility. Yeah. And that's just the way the world is. And yeah. there's nothing you can do to, to please those people. So my, my tip is to forget those people and focus on your tribe. Know that you're doing, as long as you're, you're being truthful to yourself um, and to the people that you're sharing your, your insights with, just focus on that. Mm, I think that's a very, very uh, sound argument, Cat Tate. It's interesting because you see a lot of companies, a lot of them don't do it well, they're now struggling to become authentic. They are. And it's just not washing, isn't it? No. It's like, you can trust us, and it's just not working. Yeah. I even noticed in my own industry, you know, in the sort of whole mentoring business and marketing space, a lot of the people that have been sort of glitzy and glamoury are now trying this whole authentic thing. Mm. I'm not sure if it, it's washing with it in a lot of cases. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting thing, and that's probably what's going to start weeding out the, the good operators from the bad, which is a good thing because we have a lot of competition out there. Um, we're not, you know, we're spoiled for choice as consumers when it comes to products and services. So this is going to be an interesting shift to see which companies stick around. Um, and, you know, this is almost a public relations point too about being transparent, about having social responsibility, all these things that companies have been able to do on a surface level for a long time. But now, you know, now the truth comes out. We want to see the proof in the pudding. So it's the whole thing of show me, don't tell me. Don't tell me that, that you're doing good things. Show me that you're doing good things mm. and then I'll trust you and then I'll buy from you. And it's funny, I'm even talking personally in my own line of work, um, things are quite different for me now because I've got a reasonable size footprint in Sydney. But I remember um, earlier on, to get my first clients, it would take me months and months and months of chipping away. Yeah. You know, and, and it's funny, why do you think it works that way, Kat? Why does it take so long just to build credibility in the market? How does that work in your awesome marketing brain? Well, I think that it comes back to... Um, being trustworthy. It takes time to build trust. You know when you're a kid and you, you had one best friend one day and one best friend the next mm. and you could just quickly trust people, trust friends like that? Well, as an adult, it doesn't work that way. We're a lot more suspicious, I think. So, um, you know, it can take time when you're starting out to build up your business and build a name for yourself. But if you've got the right thing to sell and you're selling to the right people and you know how to promote that properly and you're truthful in the way that you do that, mm. you will build a really great network around you of people who support your business and refer you on. And I think what you've found, and I've certainly found this too, is once you start <clears throat> networking and, and building great relationships with people, people you know and like and trust, then they, you know, refer on very quickly to other people. And it's kind of like the, the rolling stone, you know, what? it just keeps picking up speed as mm. it goes on. And it's funny, and I like, um, it's funny, um, this interview is turning into me using you for free consulting. <laughs> So, yeah, um, and because I'm interviewing Kat, she, she's not allowed to send me an invoice for this. Um, who, who says? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. We'll have to wind up. That's the interview. No, just <laughs> um, I guess one thing that's got me sort of interested in, you got me thinking about my own business now. Seriously, I actually mm -hmm. am using you for free consulting now. Cool. Is that in my, in my own business, I mean, pretty much around mid last year, my business just sort of cracked that next level. And right now my business is, as you know, is cracking that then level above it. And mm -hmm. the thing I've always done from day one is I've been straight up, like no contracts with people, 100% uh, honest, um, no bull, and I'm all for telling people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And I think Good. it's spot on. That has worked very well for me. Yeah. I get a lot of referrals these days and I find that there are plenty of people who've been in the market longer than me that just don't have the reputation I do. Mm. They may not have as long a list of enemies as me, <laughs> uh, which is growing every day. But um, but it's funny, I think, uh, in hindsight, I think I've been very authentic, mm. and which is contributed. Would you, what do you think of me? What's yeah. A, 
Yeah, Is that a fair comment? I would say it's a very fair comment. And I think that's why people are drawn to you. Um, and, I, you know, as long as you can continue to do that and not be afraid of polarising people, then you've got a great model. That, that polarisation issue, that was tough for me the first yeah. month of the year. I was... After I, I got this one phone call and I could not think properly for two days. Wow. Just someone ripping into me, abusing me. And these days I laugh at them. <laughs> like if, if someone rang me up now, i just sit there and, I don't know, threaten them or sort of, mm. you know, I'd mm. say, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to ring up Tony Abbott and he's going to, you know, stick you in the Manus Detention Centre or something. Right? <laughs> but, you know, it's, when I first got those calls, it was confronting, mm. you know, and it's, I think. You need a very strong psychology and purpose to really go against, you know, your critics like that. You do. So I take it, how are you, do you have a, a rising list of critics? Because you seem like a pretty likeable character, but. Uh, you know, and I think that's probably why you struggled, like everyone does, but why you in particular struggled at the start with getting criticism is because you like to be liked as well. You're a likeable person. You want to do good by people. And so when. When you're criticised, it really cuts deep. It did, yeah. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you yeah. or the audience. But, yeah, it, I'm all right now. But yes. at the time, it was devastating. Yeah. Um, but, no, look, I haven't experienced that yet. And uh, a reason for that is that I'm still building my tribe and I'm starting to find my voice. And I'm sure that once I get uh, a lot, of, you know, a stronger voice and start to really put my insights out there, sure, I'm going to polarise people. But that's all part of being a leader. And it's funny you say that because... What I've noticed is that for every 20 people that like me, one person will hate me. And they're not bad odds, I've no, got to say. I was honest, yeah, <laughs> my, the list of people who hate me grows way lower than the people that like me. And so I think the psychology for that is understanding that mechanism. Mm. You know, if you want to make 20 friends, there's going to be someone who's out to kill you. You know, so if you want 100 friends, then you've got to live with five people out to kill you, for yes. example. <laughs> I think it's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be fascinating when you come back from Vietnam. Yeah. And, um, you know, I can give you some advice on how to polarise people. Perfect. You know? Yeah, you know, um, you know, let's let's pick on someone. In fact, actually, um, you know what I've been doing? Um, so, you know, I'm a pretty right-wing character. Oh, are you? Right. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, but <laughs> but when it comes to to gays, I'm 100% gay marriage, 100% pro-gay. I'm Fantastic. a Christian too. Yeah. And it's funny over social media. Um, whenever there's been a lot of posts lately coming out saying, basically saying, look, I'm straight, but I'm pro gay marriage. And I've been really beating that drum. Mm. And what happened originally when I started, basically, I would put things up on Facebook saying, if you're not pro gay marriage, you're basically a Nazi. Wow. I nearly choked on my cheese just then. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's a strong, <laughs> strong thing to say. And no one's just, no, I noticed no one. And I, I even put up a post the other day, um, yes. this is yesterday about gay marriage saying, if you're against gay marriage, you're a hater. No one's disagreeing with me anymore. Mm -hmm. what, what, a, what a fantastic thing that is. Yeah, why isn't anyone disagreeing with me anymore? Maybe because the majority of people think it's ridiculous that we don't have gay rights. Oh, I think it's crazy. I, I, yeah. know, I know our conversation is about gay rights, but going on that arc, but what actually um, has been interesting is, uh, you know, I, I, it was from George Takai, you know, mm -hmm. Sulu from Star Trek, you know, mm -hmm. came out, you know, Japanese guy came out, gay and all that, right, great yeah. stuff. What he did, he puts up a lot of pace, a lot of posts. They say, "I'm straight, but I'm a, I'm I'm on these guys' side." And uh -huh. obviously, I'm straight. You know, everyone thinks I'm gay because I'm a Melbourne accent. There was anything wrong with that? <laughs> Do you want an arm wrestle? No. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a beer. Anyway, <laughs> I'm a lumberjack. <laughs> well, stop, Kate. Stop it. Yeah, stop it. Okay, sorry. Back to back to business. Anyway. Yes. Anyway, the point being is um, in these articles, um, we had this one person get on there and just trash gays mm. using religious justification. Mm. And again, I'm a religious person, so that merely puts a black mark against my name. But going back to you, what was interesting, everyone just jumped on there, including mm. me, and just ripped this guy up. Yeah. And I called him a Nazi. Wow. Yeah, and um, it's funny. What I found is, you know that whole hating thing? You know mm. how when you take a stand and there are certain people against you? I find once you get a bit of traction, they tend to back off. They do. Why is that? Are they getting scared? They know they're going to lose? Oh, look, this is a whole other discussion um, mm. in terms of, you know, the whole online troll issue. Mm. People, and unfortunately, there have been a lot of teen suicides in the media lately because of online trolls. You know, there are girls, there are girls posting about um, breaking up with their boyfriends and these people who don't even know this girl will jump on and say, well, you should kill yourself, you're hopeless, you're worthless. And, uh, you know, this isn't an isolated incident. This is happening around the world. And it's not just teenagers, it's adults too. And it's all sorts of hate. 
It's racism, it's uh, homophobia, mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, just bullying in its worst form because people feel they can hide behind these fake online, you know, identities and it's disgusting. But when you get enough people standing up for something, yeah, those people are going to back down. So we need to keep this swell going of saying, no, it's not okay to be an online bully or a bully in any sense, but particularly online, it's not okay. And I think that if we can keep that up, then our governments are going to change. Mm. They have to represent what the majority wants. For example, anti-bullying, you know, pro-gay marriage, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, it, it's got to shift. And it's look, it's starting to, you know, cities around the world, every now and then we hear another city has accepted um, gay marriage and that's fantastic, but it needs to be quicker. It needs to be everywhere. Yeah, and what's interesting, I mean, I'm obviously, you know, I'm an ex-military um, you know, operative, you know, and I'm very right. But even I've jumped the fence. Even I'm like the first guy saying, hey, gay marriage is great. And if you're against us, you're a Nazi, you know. And it's funny, um, I, I think I'm sort of going back to your original tribe comment, which has got me thinking while I'm using you for this free consulting, <laughs> which is just great, Kat Tate, is I think that, you know, when you, I think the hard thing is, and, I'll, and this is the process I'm going through, which I'm sure you'll go through, is that when you start off, uh, when you start off, the early criticism hurts, but you sort of get used to it. Yeah. And this might sound odd. I now miss it. Ah. No one's coming after me anymore. So you it's need, getting... to, need to strengthen your opinion. Yeah, I'm calling people anti-gay marriage Nazis and they're no longer biting. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Yeah, interesting. So in other words, I'm becoming, I must be a wallflower, uh, can't mm, take. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. i got to tell you, I love this uh, tribe thinking. Actually, question for you. Yes. What are things that we can do as small business owners who love marketing entrepreneurialism? What can we do to speed up this tribe process? What What are your uh, What are Cat's uh, top tips on that one? Well, I think the first thing is to, you know, a lot of small businesses, but not business owners don't have a lot of time on their hands or a lot of money. Right? We've all been there. We're all at that point. We've got a limited amount of money, a limited amount of time uh, to do things like marketing and building a community and that sort of thing. So. A lot of small businesses seem to freak out and think they have to be everywhere at once. Like, oh, I've got to get my Twitter. I've got to be on Facebook. I've got to get a Pinterest account. I've got to be blogging every day. I I've stayed out of Pinterest. Yeah. Yeah, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, for some businesses, Pinterest is, is the way to go. But, you know, people seem to think they have to do everything now and it has to be perfect. It doesn't. Sit back and think, where is my tribe gathering? So, for instance, your tribe seems to be on Facebook, I would say, predominantly. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely, yeah. absolutely Facebook. A little bit on LinkedIn, but mostly Facebook. Yeah, whereas for me, my tribe was on Twitter. Really? Yes. It's a very strong uh, creatives slash writing slash designer community on Twitter. Um, and obviously there are a lot of media outlets on there too and, and spokespeople. So that's where I tend to go. That's where my audience gathers. Um, a little bit of Facebook, but not so much. So, you know, have a think about where your audience is gathering, test it out, but don't think you have to do everything at once. There's no point being, you know, over there if your tribe's over here because no one's going to hear you or the wrong people are going to hear you and you'll get nowhere. Mm. So don't be afraid to just t trial and error, suss out where everyone is and then go to where the, that audience is and start speaking to them. Um, my second tip would be once you've found where they are, focus on being authentic. Please don't sell to me. Don't, don't, you know, send me a tweet about buying something from you. I'm going to block you, unfollow you, whatever to get you out of my face, right? Start a conversation with your tribe instead. Ask them questions. Hey, you know, what's, what's the biggest accounting issue that you've got? Or how have you lost money this month? Or, you know, um, do you like your website or not? Whatever industry you're in, start asking questions to your tribe, mm. start getting involved in discussions, but not with the agenda of selling. If you go in there with the agenda of selling, you're not going to get anywhere and it's unauthentic. It's funny you say that because as you know, I've never really sold that hard in my business. In fact, I don't really sell that much. Yeah. 90% of my communications is information. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit is, please buy me. Yeah, but please. It, yeah, please, I can use <laughs> information to help you. I have bills. <laughs> yeah. no, I see what you mean because I mean, I sell, but I actually don't sell that much. Mm. It's funny, so it's a lot of my strategy is just putting out the content and people come in and say, yeah, I'm interested in consuming your services. Yeah, and I think that's about being generous. 
as well. So being generous with your time and being generous with the information that you share. So uh, the question um, and point, uh, in my industry, very, very few people give away much. (laughs) Yeah. And I think it's the most stupidest marketing strategy ever. But what's your take on that whole issue, Kat Tate? I would agree. I would agree. I think you've got to be generous. Um, I think people think that if they give things away for free that their competition is going to come in and steal it. Well, let them. Yeah, just give away more stuff for free. Just give away more stuff for free and just be, be confident in what you're doing and don't worry about the competition. Um, but, yeah, definitely be generous. Um, don't have the agenda of selling. Things like, you know, whether it's an ebook that you give away, whether it's your information through a blog post, um, even if it's just having a conversation with someone, call up a customer, find out how they're going, just give them some free tips that, you know, that's the way that you build relationships. Uh, that's actually, you've just described exactly how I've built one business to this date and time. Well, there you go. Out, out of interest, and while I've got you for some free consulting cat tape, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I started blogging uh, two months ago, uh, probably seriously six weeks ago. And I used to do about five visits to my website a day. Now it's about 40 to 10, 50 a day. Woohoo! And I've got not just me, but I've got a lot of people who are going into blogging. From your experience, if you're, let's say, using blogging or, you know, let's say blogging is a common strategy, mm-hmm. how much blogging do you think it takes to sort of get real traction out there? To really that's, get your that's, tribe resonating? That's the million dollar question. Yeah. That's going to be different for everyone. Um, apologies for that. I just knocked the table, everybody. <laughs> but no, that's that's something that you've really got to just try. Um, it'll be different for different businesses. The important thing really when you're starting out is not to think, I have to put a post out every single day. The important thing is that you're regular. Mm. So if you don't think that you can do a post a day, don't start out doing a post a day. And this might be a blog post. This might be Facebook use. This might be Twitter use. Absolutely. Whatever yep. your marketing strategy is, whatever tactic you, you choose to use um, to push your ideas out there, um, it's more about setting expectations. So if I sign up to your blog and you tell me that you're sending out a weekly newsletter or blog post or whatever it might be, or you know, if I know that every day you put something on Twitter, if suddenly that stops, I'm going to be a bit confused and probably drop out because I'm not, I don't feel like you've delivered what the expectation was. And also I'm not seeing you enough. You're not kind of in front of my mind enough for me to stay as part of your tribe. So, oh, it's just crack. I'm <laughs> choking on a cracker over here. I'm choking on a cracker. <laughs> He's choked up by my brilliant ideas. Yeah. And, um, and, and there's so much to choke on. Listen <laughs> to my voice. Yeah. Um, yeah, where were we? What were we talking about? Well, before I started choking on this cracker that I'm eating, <laughs> you, you were talking about it's be it social media or blogging or marketing. It's not so much the quantity of information, but it's more the consistency of information. Consistency and quality. A mm. lot of people come to me and say, "Oh, I, you know, I'm just a really bad writer. I just, I don't think I can write or blog or tweet or whatever. I'm just such a terrible writer." And, you know, there are a lot of copywriters who will disagree with me here, and that's fine. But don't worry about being a good writer. Don't worry about your spelling. That's not the reason why That's not the reason why your tribe is coming to you, and that's not the reason why your tribe is sticking around. Mm. They're coming to you and they're sticking around because they, you have ideas, opinions, and insights and information that's really sticky, that they go, yes, that's what I want to hear. So they're not there picking up on typos and, you know, putting a fine-tooth comb over your copy. There'll be people who will do that. Any blog or any content you put out there, someone's going to tell you, oh, you should have put an apostrophe there, or you don't spell it that way, but that's the whole online job. But we just dob them into the federal police. Well, you just ignore them. Just yeah. don't give them a voice. Leave their comments up. Don't delete them. Or, or do what I do to people anti-gay, put photos of Hitler up there and say that's them. Yeah, that's probably the more extreme approach. Yeah. Uh, my approach is usually to ignore them. Let them have their voice. Leave the comments there, but don't worry about that. Focus instead on your ideas. You're in business because you've got ideas. If you're succeeding in business, it's because you're doing some good stuff. So get the good stuff out there. And I think that's really, I suppose, the the crescendo of what we're sort of saying here is that I think the sentiment of what you're getting at, Kat, is don't be afraid to be different and put that view forward. Absolutely. This has been one amazing uh, interview, (laughs) Kat. Yeah. I was going to say, before we let people get back to their morning tea or afternoon tea or dinner, What's your advice to the audience? In fact, I have a better question for you. If you could go back in time right now to see a cat tape from three to five years ago, what would you tell her? 
I would probably say that everything that you need to have the life that you want is in you. Don't look for anyone else to prop you up, support you, um, give you feedback. Forget it. Forget anything that's external. Be yourself. As you say, be different and be resilient. Know that you've got everything you need to live the life that you want and then don't take no for an answer. Wow. And there you go. Um, you've heard it first, the exclusive interview <laughs> of Cat Tate on Channel Edward. Yeah, I just want to say this has been amazing, Cat, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's been a pleasure working with you and I love sending business your way because you're great at handling copywriting. So amazing interview. Make sure you Google cattape.com.au. Is, is, is your website still going to be? It's actually uh, cattapecopywriting.com.au. Um, yes, I probably will be rebranding at some point, but there'll be a redirect there. So don't worry. If you type that in, you'll still get to my site. Excellent. So we'll call it RoboCat when she's a she's partnership <laughs> part. She's a part beach girl, part machine. That's We're looking it. forward to it. But look, I just want to say thank you, Kat. This has been absolutely amazing. We've got to get ready for our webinar that starts very soon. We do. We need to get the technology cranking and get onto it. Excellent. Guys, Edward Zier, Small Business Marketing Mentor, signing out. Goodbye from me. Bye-bye. PR job outside of university, um, I think they saw definitely the potential there. Um, they saw the strength in my writing as well, and they they gave me a shot. So it was brilliant. <laughs> so you got off of your job, you packed your bag, you yeah. flew over to Sydney, yeah. and, and then what you see started this job. You got this amazing job. What then happened? So I was there for just over a year, and it was a fantastic job. You know, I met David Beckham. Um, I'd be in the change room. <laughs> I'd be in the change rooms and there's NRL players just undressing in front of me with no care in the world and I'm sort of trying to be professional and not looking, you know, <laughs> and just seeing all these great people and, and – um, So you had the iPhone up? No, you no, didn't. No, <laughs> this is a pre-iPhone age, so – oh. <laughs> <You're, clears throat> I think I had a BlackBerry at the time. Ah, so you had your old BlackBerry yeah. making out you're sending emails. Yeah, that's This it. might have been before YouTube as well. <laughs> These days we'd upload straight to YouTube, wouldn't we? Yeah, but not then. Um, but I loved it. I love the mm. thrill of – and I'm not really a big sports person, to be honest. I don't really enjoy watching sport except AFL, which is fabulous. Um, well, you know I'm a Victorian, don't you? I do. You're a yeah. Victorian. As a proud Victorian, we're very proud of AFL. I know that. I think all sports suck, but I'm very proud of yes, AFL. Yes, I feel that. the same way. <laughs> <laughs> sports sucks, but if I have to watch it, AFL. That, that's right, because Perth's an AFL town. It is. We don't have NRL. You're a real town. Yeah. Only New South Wales is corrupted with this rugby it's stuff. This so-called rugby. Uh, I, and, and it's not like this interview is being recorded and it's not going to go up on my blog and get viewed hundreds of times, mm -hmm. but I think rugby's, I think it's a bit, you know, a bit, bit bogany, don't you, uh, Cat Tate? <laughs> <laughs> no comment, Ed Zia. Yeah, actually, we could have rugby clients. We like rugby. We like rugby. <laughs> All codes of rugby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But you've got to give it to rugby. They do know how to beat each other up out on the field. They do. Well done. Much more violent than AFL. Yeah. So you're here. You're, you've are you got this amazing job, this amazing life. What, what was before you started off as the amazing entrepreneur you are today? What, what job were you in before that? And what were the events that made you say, it's time for me to be my own woman? Well... There's another chapter oh, to be revealed. The hidden chapter. There's a hidden chapter. Oh, I, I want to hear Would it. Would you like to hear the hidden chapter? First you hear it on the Edward Files. <laughs> exclusive. Mm -hmm. The exclusive chapter is that um, I, after the stadium, I took a job working for the Heart Foundation. Oh, wow, not for profit. Not for profit, um, working in their PR department. And um, that was great because I, I felt like I was starting to make a difference with my work, which is what I was always planning to do, is find some way to, to use words to benefit the world in some way. So that was brilliant. Um, but look, it, it wasn't quite right for me. And I, being the entrepreneur that I am, I decided to quit in the middle of the recession and become a professional organiser. Right. Very abstract, I know. And obviously, the obviously, the and mentioned that you know I'd been thinking about making a shift out of journalism, and she said, "Well, 
I'm looking for someone to come into my PR firm and work as a junior and work their way up. What do you think? Wow. So you just became a publicist from day one. I did. Straight into it. So complaints are a good thing. Yeah. So you, <laughs> you, 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 were, you were about to take a complaint and you're out getting an awesome job and a new break. Yeah, which took me on a whole new path and, and took me to where I am now. So, so what is it? Tell us what the what does a publicist actually do? What did you actually do at this PR firm? Uh, look, there's there's a whole um, there's a whole you know big picture view when it comes to public relations. So what we would do is we would start with a client, um, find out a bit about what they want to promote or publicise in their business, and come up with a communication strategy. And often that would be a twelve month plan. So we're looking at things like okay, what's coming up that you want to promote. Uh, what events are on out there that we can actually leverage off? So let's just say, um, you know, you've got a client in the gift basket area. Yeah, you go out and it. find events on, you know, Valentine's Day and all the obvious ones and maybe some more obscure events that you can promote. Um, we would launch and stage media events as well and invite the media along. Um, writing press releases, a lot of sort of client liaison work. Um, one client of ours actually was a, a national park and we, we had to come up with a crisis communications plan. And actually when there was a bushfire, we were the first port of call for when the media were making inquiries. And so that was a really intense uh, part of the job, which was quite rewarding as well. So during what, bushfires in Perth, you were the first line, you were the first call once. Yeah, the- once the news hits, there's a fire and it's at the park that, that we represent. Mm-hmm. The, the journos call us because they know we've got that relationship with them. They know that that's who they need to call. And it's our job to then, uh, um, I suppose, line up those media calls, get them through to the client, get the information back to the media so they can give it to the public. Wow, so you've yeah. worked in some pretty high stress, extreme situations. Yes, and this was all before I was 20. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought you were like 25 about this point in the story. So before no, you were 20. Because what happened was I actually, um, I finished school quite young. I finished year 12 when I was 16 and went straight to university. So my first year at uni, I was 17. And I went straight through uni, finished a three-year degree and was out pretty pretty young. It's funny you said that. I was actually 17 when I was at uni. Were you? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, and when I was 18, I went and joined the army. There oh, you go. Oh, look at you. Yeah, look Doing at me now. Country. Yeah, now a traumatised <laughs> marketing mentor. Yeah. That, um, that's amazing. So before the age of 20, you've already worked in a newsroom. You've been up all night listening to police comm channels. You've had epiphanies. Mm-hmm. And you've already done crisis management. Yeah. In extreme situations before the age of 20. Yes. <laughs> Not bad. No, no, no wonder you're this brilliant, amazing person in front of you with those experiences. Oh, well, yeah. It's funny. You don't really think about the things that you do until someone says, hey, you did this and you did this and you did this. And then it's like, oh, I've actually done quite a lot. I think it's very um, compelling. So what happened after that? So, like, was it obviously we're in Sydney now. Yes. How did you get to Sydney? Like, where did you say I'm sick of this mining colony called? Good day, everyone. This is Ed Woods here, marketing mentor who loves small business, and I'm sitting here with the amazing entrepreneur, Kat Tate. How are you, Kat? Very well, thank you. And and Kat Tate is an amazing channel partner of mine. She is a brilliant online copywriter and strategic storyteller, aren't you, Kat Tate? I suppose I am. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just named what she did for a living, and it's interesting. We're sitting in my kitchen, and we've got, what have we got here? We've got... Uh, Cheese. Crackers. Uh, I think that's cucumber, isn't it? A cucumber. Yeah, it's lovely. It, exactly. We've got an amazing spread. And Kat and I are actually having some, basically some wine and cheese before we do our webinar tonight. And um, I've been meaning to do this anyway. I actually interview Kat and get to hear her story. And we actually started exchanging our stories. And we thought, why don't we record this and make this an awesome entrepreneur interview? What did you think of that, Kat? I thought fantastic. Absolutely. Let's do it. Now, where it was, Kat Tate's um, an amazing copywriter. I'm actually a brilliant copywriter. But Kat Tate's better than me. And, and I've been very lucky to work with Kat Tate, and I refer a lot of work for her to take people's ideas into powerful words that sell in. I think you're really good at that, Kat, and I just want to think, do you think you're really good, Kat? I do. Great. Writing, Ta- writing is an art form. Yes. Um, just like design and, you know, anything, any other creative um, avenue that you choose to take, writing is an art form. It's something that takes a long time to finesse and to perfect, and it never is perfect. Um, but I love it. I love what I do. So I was going to say, Kat, I mean, 
tell me, tell us your story. I mean, I mean, you're an amazing copywriter. I've seen your work firsthand. I'll refer you gladly to my clients. You do. Thank you very much. And the checks in the mail. And uh, <laughs> no, no, Kat's been an amazing client one too. And um, but t- tell us your story. Like, what did you do when you're at uni? How did you become the successful entrepreneur you are today? Um, look, I've been writing since I was able to walk. Really, my parents had a typewriter, and the first thing I did when I learned to walk and stand at a typewriter was write short stories. Um, so I started really, really young. My dad was a journalist and still is, um, quite a prominent journo. He went to Fleet Street uh, when he was 18 and uh, interviewed Roy Orbison and Rod Stewart and all sorts of people back, back in the day. So I, I loved what he did and, um, and wanted to follow in his footsteps, which was the plan. So what I did was while I was at uni, I actually um, started working at the Sunday Times in Perth. And that was – it's the sister paper of the Daily Telegraph, basically, for those Sydney Sydney siders. Oh, so listening. it's a good right-leaning – Oh, yeah. It's, so it's a pro-liberal newspaper. Oh, yeah. And they're small – are they just – <laughs> do they just love Tony Abbott the way I do? Look, I don't know what their policy is. I don't read the paper anymore being in Sydney, but I'm <laughs> – you know, I wouldn't be surprised. But, no, it was a great paper to work for. And the plan there was um, that I would work my way up and get a cadetship like my dad did at the same newspaper when he was the same age. No way. So you were like a, a young Chris Hansen. You're just working your way up the uh, tree would... in Perth. <laughs> you can never get sick of Perth. It's a beautiful place. It, what happened? Um, How did you wind up in, in my well, uh, kitchen? Well, look, the, the Perth, as beautiful as Perth is, the media market at the time, and I guess you know still is, uh, was very small. And there's only so far you can go. So it got to the point where I thought, okay, I've, I've, um, I've had some great inroads here. I've done some great work with some fantastic clients. But Perth doesn't really have much going on for me anymore. Uh, I guess another big part was that I was born in Sydney and always planned to return. Oh, born yeah. in Sydney, huh? Yeah. Where were you born? Born up in Newport on the beaches. So. And, and so now you live in Manly Beaches. Exactly. You, you, re- you return back to the place of your birth, That's did you? That's it. Back to my roots and it feels great. So the shift from Perth to Sydney happened when um, really I just started applying for public relations work in Sydney and uh, caught the eye of ANZ Stadium, Telstra Stadium at the time, Olympic Stadium. It goes, goes by a few names <laughs> depending on the sponsorship at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and they actually flew me over from Perth to Sydney to hang out with them for the weekend and go to a few sports games and interview myself and, you know, get a feel for the organisation. And they offered me the job when I flew back to Perth. So then I came over. <laughs> you're, you're like a superstar, so you're in Perth. Yeah. You apply for jobs remotely. You get flown out to Telstra Stadium for the weekend. Yes. And you became, a what, a publicist for Public a, relations for Telstra, coordinator. For Olympic Park. For the entire stadium, Yes. My um, God, you're yeah. a, you've had some pretty high profile uh, positions, Kate. I have. Tate. I have. I've, um, yeah, I feel I've been very fortunate. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm sure luck is part of it, Kat, but surely your skills and prowess with words would attest to you getting those roles. Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I won't argue with that. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make out your egotistical because yeah. I think your success is amazing. Why? And I'm not asking, I'm not trying to set you up to be egotistical, mm. but. Why did you get those prestigious roles? What traits about yourself did they think were very employable? That's a very hard question to answer. Um, look, I guess growing up in a family with a journalist as a dad um, and mixing with a lot of prominent people from a young age, I grew up quite quickly. So, you know, I'd be at media launches when I was eight talking to celebrities and whoever, you know, so I just sort of... Um, I was always used to adult company. I, I discovered a way to present myself that, um, that um, you know, formed really good relationships with people because that's what my dad did. He was a gossip journalist at the end of his career, towards the end of his career. He's retired now. But even when he was a gossip journalist, he always uh, he kept his word. He never broke promises with those people that he was writing about um, and he formed really good relationships with people. So I think I, I just naturally, you know, absorbed that. And so it's always been my thing mm. to to put people before anything else, um, and maybe that's helped. Yes, I can imagine. They, I can imagine you would have just gone in there, and they would have just felt your energy and realised, no, this woman understands what we're about. We yeah. definitely want to offer her the role. Yeah, and look, I think that uh, even though I would have had gaps in my skill set at that age, that was the plan. That was the plan. So. Um, yeah, and I was doing a graveyard shift one night, which was basically sitting next to the police radio at three in the morning waiting for a story to come through. 
And uh, I so hope- stop right there. So you're saying, as a journalist, you would sit there listening to the police radio as a 17 year old. Yes. So you're listening. Is that legal? Absolutely. So a journalist yeah. is allowed to listen to a police commute channel. Yes, because it's put out there for the media to listen to. Um, the police and the media actually have a really good relationship, particularly in Perth. Uh, they share stories a lot. Um, press releases are sent through from the, the police department and we can rewrite them for the paper. So uh, they've got a pretty strong relationship. The, the police have a, a reason to get that information out to the public. Wow, so you guys yeah. get along. So you're so you're a 17 year old version of. So it was about two years ago, right? So oh, look, no, 18 months ago. <laughs> yeah, zero, zero, I mean, just so you know, everyone. Um, yeah, Kat's an amazing woman. So there you go. Oh, so okay. th- there you go. So you're a 17 year old cat. You're sitting there, and you're listening to a police radio, waiting for action. That's it. What would what would happen when you're sitting in Perth, uh, waiting for action? What kind of stuff would you hear? Crickets. No, I'm kidding. There was, there was actually, things actually did happen in, in Sleepy Old Perth. Um, look, unfortunately, a lot of it was things like car accidents. Uh-huh. And actually, that's the reason why I changed my direction from hard news because I had a comment made to me one night <clears throat> by someone on the editorial team who basically told me to pray for a double fatality to get a good front page lead. And that just changed everything because I realised, okay, I'm, I've got into writing because I want to change the world through words. I feel like that's my calling. And to be working in a way that actually is wishing for the ill to come on people for my own benefit is not what I want to do. So that was a big shift for me. Wow, wow. And uh, excuse the noise in the background. <laughs> We've got two cats, our office staff are fighting each other. Yeah. Um, being you need to do some mediation there. Yeah, we need mediation. Yeah. yeah. Not meditation. No. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That must have been scary. So yeah. you're sitting there as a 17-year-old, you're listening to a police comm channel, and you're told to hope for a double fatality. Yes. What was your immediate reaction? What went through your mind when this information hit your senses? Well, you know how when people say that something, it's like a, like, like a light bulb moment or it's like a brick wall goes up or, you know, there's a really profound moment in their life? That's what that was. So it was the next day that I decided I couldn't do couldn't do hard journalism anymore. It wasn't my thing. So what happened the next day? So you got up, you arrived at work. What did you do? Um, look, I, I figured I'd sort of keep going for a little bit until I worked out my next move. Um, but as things in my life seem to have happened um, in a way that things just fall into place, there was a phone call that came through the newsroom and I happened to pick the phone up. And it was an old family friend uh, of my family's who now had her own PR company. And uh-huh. she called, yes, and she'd called to uh, blast one of the journalists for a story about her client. And I recognised the name and the voice and started talking to 